So today's panel, the, the last panel is on emerging issues in student privacy. Um, and so as we've covered throughout the day, engaging on student privacy is multidimensional, and it's really important to include all of the stakeholder groups that are affected. Um, so that includes not just um, education agencies and companies, but also students, parents, and school administrators. So policymakers and education leaders need to have that holistic understanding of how student privacy affects all stakeholders. So we've brought together a panel that can speak to those unique perspectives. Um, the panelists today include Olga Garcia Kaplan, Patricia Julianel, Melissa Tebenkamp, and Amelia Vance, who you've heard from today. Um, please feel free to drop questions in the chat um, as we go through the questions that we've prepared today. I'm more than happy to take those as we go. Um, so to begin, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'd like to go around the room and have introductions, but then I'd also like to hear what student privacy issues keep you folks up at night. Um, so starting with Olga. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Olga Garcia Kaplan. I am a parent advocate. I have three children, uh, high school, middle school, and elementary school kids. Uh, privacy is front and center for me. Uh, what keeps me up at night on, on privacy issues? Uh, so, so much. But uh, primarily, you know, who's looking at my kids' data? Who has access to it? Are we protecting their information? And are we using that information to help them improve their education and help them become better learners? Uh, you know, who's looking at all this and, and are we using it effectively? Thank you, Olga. Patricia? Thanks, Anisha. My name is Patricia Julianel. I am a senior strategist at Schoolhouse Connection, a national nonprofit organization working to overcome homelessness through education. So we're focused on the over 1.4 million students in K-12 schools who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and I guess I worry about a lot also, I, I worry about inappropriate disclosure of information about homelessness and how that can impact children, youth, and families. Um, everything from getting them and people who took them in evicted because they're over occupancy limits in an apartment and that information somehow gets out. Um, things around domestic violence and allowing abusing, uh, abusive partners to find a parent and a child who may have been fleeing and are now in a domestic violence shelter. Um, and even things like bullying, we know that students experiencing homelessness are more likely to be bullied, they're more likely to attempt suicide, and when peers and even school staff find out uh, private information like homelessness, it can really trigger some of those issues. Thank you, Patricia. Melissa? So, Melissa Temenkamp, I'm the Chief Information Officer for Raytown, and um, so much keeps us up at night when it comes to privacy. And those, um, there was a comment about, we see the same faces. And so many of you who have seen my face know that I'm a pretty big watchdog in my district for student privacy. And so, you know, we try to check those boxes and make sure that um, we're not sharing information with folks who shouldn't have it. And, and we do all of the contractual and the vetting of the vendors. And we do everything within our power to keep our students data safe, but there are things that are outside of my power. And those are the things that keep me up at night. The ransomware attacks, the, um, the security breaches, there's so much that I can control. And those who know me know that I, I love to control things, um, but there's so much that I can't. And just trying to figure out what's that next risk and how can we mitigate it? And I'm always on the lookout of what can we do to mitigate that next risk? What can we put in place? What are we not doing as well as we should be? And just really thinking about how can we come, become better because even the best can always get better. Thank you, Melissa. Amelia. So hello all, if you're just joining us for this panel, Amelia Vance, I'm the director of our youth and education privacy work at FPF. So uh, like everyone else, there are many student privacy issues keeping me up at night. This is maybe a bad question because we're all like, we have all of them. Um, I think the top ones most recently are the issues that disproportionately harm vulnerable students. Um, so as Patricia mentioned, um, things that can lead to children being stigmatized or bullied. Um, monitoring students and often the lack of transparency that goes on when students are monitored. Um, 
sharing student data um, inappropriately uh, with, say, you know, law enforcement um, or other outside entities in ways that could harm a child's future. Um, but perhaps one of the all of those are big ones, but one of the ones that I spend a lot of my time on, in case anyone couldn't tell, is how do we enable data and tech to be used in education to help students, to further um, student success, but put in place privacy guardrails that make sure that that information isn't used inappropriately, isn't shared in ways that um, parents or students might find uh, inappropriate or creepy. Um, and finding that balance is incredibly difficult. Um, thankfully, we do have all of these experiments in states uh, where uh, people have teetered on one side or the other of too much or not enough um, uh, or not sufficient privacy built into other laws. But um, it's something where, as you know, federal policymakers are looking more and more at this, uh, there are a lot of lessons learned and best practices that we can take away. Thank you all. Um, I think that gives us a little interesting um, footing for the next question, which is about how the pandemic has affected your perceptions of student privacy and the effectiveness of current frameworks. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about some shortcomings you've seen and some opportunities that you've seen from current frameworks, uh, starting with Melissa. So when we when the pandemic hit, um, I, I was in a, in a great position to see what's happening in some other districts as well and helping some of my colleagues through that transition to online learning. And then um, my kiddos actually attend a different school district than what I lead in. And, and so I, I got to experience that from a parent side. And I will tell you as a parent of a school district, I had to just finally step up and say, whoa, what are you doing for my kiddos? And I, I do feel sorry for their teachers because I'm not the parent you want because I will call you out when you're using a resource you shouldn't be with my kiddos. Um, and I watch what they use. So, um, so I feel you, Olga, I, I, I play that part as well. But, um, you know, we had in the pandemic, we had everybody reaching for tools to try to help with the transition and not always that framework already established in a school district for vetting resources, for making sure that the resources were safe, for taking into consideration, why are we even using this? And, you know, I have two kids and I had five different communi new communication portals that were opened up for my kids for them to communicate with me. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. You guys pick one. Um, quit sharing all of this information with everybody. And so I think I took that and in Raytown, we vet everything and we try to not duplicate resources. It's easier on the teachers. It's easier on the parents. There's one communication tool, or maybe there's two or three that we use different ways, but we're not sharing that information with everybody. And to uh, for us, that's a framework that works. When the pandemic hit, we actually scaled back the number of resources we use that were digital resources. We focused on the ones that we knew worked well. And then we brought that same philosophy into this school year. Let's only use the ones that we know are giving us the data and the you know and, and meeting our, our students' needs that um, we know are safe. And let's slow down the adoption of everything else just because it's free, just because they're marketing to us doesn't mean we need to use it. And that framework has been really successful. Now, with this move, my newest challenge was career ed. And it was something that I had never experienced before in all of my years of working on contracts and with vendors is that I had this small group of high school students who are actually in adult programs at our career center. And it used to be these programs had pencil paper tests. The parents signed off on it. They passed the test, they got their certification. We just reported back to the state that they met their, their criteria for their class and that was all that we had. And now they're all moving online. And guess what? They're adult learning programs, they're not made for K-12. And so I will say that that was the one, um, a shortcoming that we have is really bridging that gap of my K-12 students and we're doing it more and more and more, preparing them for post-secondary, I have students who are graduating with advanced welding sort of 
certifications. They have to take those exams. My nurses that are getting degrees while they're graduating from high school. And then how do we handle that transition, keep their educational records safe, keep their data safe and private, but also allow them to engage in those programs. So I will say that that's my new challenge. Um, and so I, I'll let somebody else um, speak to what theirs are. Thank you, Melissa. Um, we'll turn to Olga. Sure. Um, well, I think uh, a previous panelist said it, right? Uh, when the pandemic hit, I think it was Alan said it was a wild west. Uh, it, it was a free fall and most schools were just add more and more technology and more apps and let's get the kids as, as much as we can out there. Um, and that wasn't as great. Um, I think it was it was very difficult in the beginning because uh, teachers wanted to teach and, and I understand that, but they thought that there's this app that I can see that I can use for my kids with math and it wasn't vetted through anything. Um, our school district was not great at communicating what was going to be used, how it was going to be used. Um, when I reached out to them, as, as Melissa said, I'm not the parent you want asking questions. <laughs> and, um, and I said, what, where is the consent form? And they basically said, oh, well, you signed it at the beginning of the year, but at the beginning of the year, we didn't have a pandemic, right? So now here we are and you're adding applications for an eight-year-old that he doesn't necessarily know how to use them. And the teachers don't necessarily know how to establish a framework for privacy for them. Um, so that was critical for, for me. Um, I do think that there were a lot of opportunities that came out of it. I think some kids, what we discovered was that some kids flourished in, in a remote environment for whatever reason it was, whether it was some learning disabilities and the system just worked better, some children were more focused, some, you know, some flourished in that environment. And I thought that was great. Um, and now I think the challenges are how do we integrate what we've learned into what we can do moving forward and have, have a better framework for it. But I think it was, there was a lot of lack of education from part of the school districts um, and teachers, um, not their fault, um, on what was the difference between security and privacy, right? And um, I work in environments that have a lot of security and compliance, but that's very different than privacy. And being concerned um, in this pandemic environment and being in, in kids' homes, whether it was with a lot of kids, no kids, um, environments that the children didn't want others to see, or even the teachers asking questions during this during the day. Oh, put in the Google chat what you had for lunch today. Well, that that's a problem, right? And teachers were not educated on those protocols as the pandemic rolled out, and we were adding more and more. Um, so I think that's um, critical for us to understand going forward because I think a remote environment is not going to go away. We're going to keep using more opportunities, more electronic learning out there, which is great. It's fantastic, but we need to educate the teachers, but also educate the parents on what we're consenting to. Um, you know, you, you sent a, a consent form Friday to say everybody's moving online on Monday and not everybody can read it. Not everybody knows how to read uh, that consent form. You don't know what you're consenting to. Um, a blanket Sure, I let my kid use Google, doesn't necessarily answer the questions that you have. Um, and I'm, you know, I think a, a lot of things that were highlighted were, how are we protecting disadvantaged communities? How are we protecting kids with learning disabilities in this environment? How do we protect their privacy? You know, once you have somebody on camera and, and you're providing all this information, into different applications that they're using. Um, is it going through a portal? Is it secure? Who has access to it? All those questions needed to be addressed. I think we're doing a better job today, 18 months into it, but I think we still have a ways to go. Thank you, Olga. Patricia? Yeah, I think, uh, and, and some of the things that I had in mind have been mentioned already. Um, one, one of the issues that we saw as a shortcoming, I, I guess two things. Um, is around the privacy uh, when students are using school issued devices. So like other low income students and students of color, students experiencing homelessness typically rely on school provided devices and, and internet. They don't usually have their own internet or their own computers. So the extent to which schools are tracking what students are doing on those computers is really concerning. They might be looking up 
mental health resources. They might be looking up issues around domestic violence or other things that are happening in their family. They, um, you know, students experiencing homelessness or more, are more likely to be LGBTQ, for example. So they might be looking up supportive resources for that. And, you know, thinking that someone might be knowing what they're looking at on their, on their browser when it's not related to a school assignment is, is definitely concerning. Um, and then other people have talked about cameras too, you know, insisting that cameras be on is really problematic for a student who's in a motel room or in an overcrowded environment where there are people moving around constantly behind them, or maybe they're in a garage, or maybe they're even in a tent, you know, on their phone trying to do a class. Um, so that kind of, of um, insistence on cameras is something that we really tried to push back on to explain you know, this is a serious privacy issue for all students, but particularly for those who might be experiencing homelessness or just in living environments that they don't uh, want to share. Um, but I do want to talk about an opportunity that, I'm, that I think is really great, which is early in the pandemic, the Student Privacy Policy Office was uh, clarified that electronic consent is valid. And I think when we went to buildings being closed, schools were routinely trying to figure out, you know, how are we going to do electronic consent? How are we going to make sure that this is secure and that it's available? But for families experiencing homelessness, that's a huge opportunity because even when school buildings are open, um, having a form, signing it and returning it actually can be a huge task for a family experiencing homelessness. They're moving around all the time, backpack get, get lost, papers get stolen. It's not that easy to just, you know, you know, if, even if you read the under, you have the time and sort of the mental capacity in that moment of trauma and stress to sit down with that paper and read it carefully and understand what it says, even just signing it and returning it is really hard. So I think electronic consent in a lot of ways worked really well for students and families experiencing homelessness. Um, and so that's something that I'd like to see, you know, with appropriate protocols in place to see if that can be something that continues to be used to make it easier for families who don't have a printer um, and are not going to really be able to deal with paper very easily. Thank you, Patricia. Amelia? So we've covered a lot already. I think that the pandemic has really shown a light on the areas where FERPA does break, where uh, you run into outdated issues. Um, it had a lot of, a lot of calls and a lot of emails and a lot of meetings with district staff, with parents, with nonprofits that had never offered online programs and before, um, during, or after the school day, uh, as everybody was trying to figure out how do I apply all of these complicated legal frameworks to our new reality? Uh, and the answer was, most of the time we're giving you the answer, it depends, but here's some practical advice uh, that allows you to make a call as opposed to just having sort of vaguely do what you think is right, maybe, but don't because you'll get in trouble. Um, and I think first and foremost, uh, it demonstrated we need clarity here. We need to not have to look at the uh, FERPA statute and then at the regulations, and then at the student privacy website run by Department of Ed to find an answer to one question. Uh, these are all deeply combined um, documents that give an answer on things about whether ed tech providers are covered by FERPA and what are the requirements and you know, when you share data with researchers, what's the form you have to fill out? Like all of that information is out there. It's almost impossible for the average person to find. I'm an expert who looks up this stuff every day and it will take me a good four minutes to pull up uh, the various documents um, and, you know, send them over in an email. And I know where to look. How do we make it easier? because we need this to be practical. We need this to be embedded in the day-to-day -day practice of our teachers, of um, the you know, after-school tutors, of the IT directors, of our principals and superintendents. We need this to not just be a compliance exercise, we need to build a culture of privacy where people have a sense of 
why asking, you know, what somebody had for lunch could harm one of their students. And right now we don't have that. We don't require training um, on privacy by colleges of teacher education. We don't require it as part of professional development. It's often not included even in the master's programs done by school administrators. If we're not giving anyone even the basic information, let alone telling them how to apply it to their jobs, how are they possibly going to do these things? And the answer is they're not. So I hope that there is more of a focus moving forward with policymaking on practical changes that clarify requirements um, and make them easier to understand and to follow and for parents to have expectations about, you know, the law says this and here's what you have to do as opposed to the fragmented framework we have right now. Thanks, Amelia. Um, Olga, turning to you to talk a little bit more about your perspective from a parent as a parent on student privacy. Um, so you alluded to this a little bit in your earlier comments, but why does it matter to parents that schools protect student data? And it'd be helpful to list out a couple of priorities on your end or parental priorities in general that comes to protecting student data privacy. And Melissa, please feel free to jump in too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the biggest thing for me in protecting student data, right, is to recognize that we're trying to protect students as they build their own educational career and, and as they build their own life as learners. Um, it's important to, for us to give students agency on what information they want to share with the world and what information they want their teachers to know about them. Um, that's critical. And I think um, when we talk about protecting student data and schools protecting student data, I think it's important for them to recognize that, that you know, as a parent, I have the best interest of my child um, at hand, but they also have an opinion. And, and what is that opinion? And I think um, we need to start listening to, to the students on what is important for them, for teachers and for schools to know about them so that they can become better learners and, and succeed in whatever their path is. Um, I, I think from my perspective, it's it's critical that schools understand, you know, you have to protect this information because who is going to see this, right? There's health information, there's mental health information, kids with IEPs. There's a lot of sensitive information in there that is critical for a teacher to know and to have to help that student. Uh, but, but it also shouldn't be going to somebody that really doesn't need to see that, right? Um, so uh, how are we educating teachers into containing that information to only the individuals that should be privy to it? And how are we educating the entire school district to understand what applications are we contracting to use? Do they have good privacy policies in place? If they don't, you know, we don't, it might be a phenomenal product, right? And, and we had this at the beginning of the pandemic, there were a few applications that were being used that didn't necessarily have the best privacy policies in, in place. But as people started to bring that up to those organizations, parents, students, advocates brought that up, they went and they redesigned that, right? And put those measures in place to protect the kids because it was a great product. So I don't think we need to discount them because they have bad privacy policies in place, but maybe you know, that's where Amelia and, and all of you guys come in and <laughs> guide them a little bit into how to improve that and, and help put, put those safeguards. Um, I think that's that's priority, you know, from, from parents is, you know, just make sure you're educating the teachers to, to understand what information is critical that stays with the educating community and, and what should be shared with the other students in the class, um, not all of them know that. And, and I think that's important to, to educate teachers on that. Thank you, Olga. Um, Patricia, what unique student privacy considerations apply to the students you represent and work with? You've mentioned some of those considerations in your opening remarks, but I definitely wanna tie in, dive, dive a little deeper into that. And then I'd also love to hear if there are any instances where privacy might go too far and potentially disadvantage the community that you work with as well. Sure, I was actually gonna cover both of those. So that's perfect. And 
I feel like I want to give Olga a standing ovation for pretty much everything you just said that it just overlaps exactly with what we see with students experiencing homelessness and you know we work primarily with school districts, but we also do work directly with um, about 150 youth experiencing homelessness and our scholars have presented on a couple of your uh, webinars in the past. So you know, we really listen to what they have to say. And what Olga said about give students agency um, made me want to stand up and clap because you know, there are three big issues, big questions that we get constantly from school districts. Um, one of the main ones is who needs to know that a student is experiencing homelessness? And we hear districts that go everything from everybody in the entire district can know, it's just in the student information system and anybody knows who's experiencing homelessness um, to you know, no one. Every school district has what's called the McKinney Vento Homeless Liaison who is in charge of providing services to students experiencing homelessness in that district or charter school. So that person obviously would know, but then beyond that person whom and you know, Obviously, teachers and counselors might want to know because they might want to put some interventions in place. They might, might want to adapt curriculum in certain ways for students who are unstable or don't have supplies or anything. But when we talk to students, they constantly say, I don't want all my teachers to know. I don't want my counselor to know. I don't want the lunch lady to know. And if I want them to know, I will tell them when I'm ready and when it's a, it's a safe time for me, when it feels safe. There's so much shame and stigma attached to that, that even when we have you know, a student's best interest in, at heart, we really do need to give them that agency to make those decisions about who does have a legitimate educational interest under those FERPA regulations. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an open question, but certainly you want to limit it, uh, I think, as much as possible. And, and why not just ask first, uh, you know, before you blast that out to the teachers or the counselors, just ask, you know, in a, in a small school or district, people know each other too, you know? So now you have somebody who all of a sudden knows that their neighbor or, you know, has some people living with them who don't belong in that home or whatever, because you're, you're putting that information out too broadly. So that's a big one. Um, the second one that I would just say is a lot of times we hear of service providers in the community. So maybe shelters or homeless service providers, even a faith-based organization that wants to provide gifts or even laptops to all the students experiencing homelessness. Again, these are wonderful things that people want to do but they'll say, just give us a list of all your homeless students. Um, and of course the school district has to say, no, no we're, we, we're not gonna do that. That's really not uh, protecting their right to privacy. And we know you wanna do something nice and helpful, but um, we're gonna have to figure out a way to make that connection in a way that gives the parent and, and or the student, again, that agency to say, do I even want this gift that they're trying to give me? And if so, let's set up a way to make sure that we can uh, remain private and confidential and they don't need to know who's getting that item. Um, so that's one thing. But, and, and then the third thing I wanted to mention is what, what you were saying at, at your last point was that sometimes privacy maybe goes a little bit far, too far and can actually prejudice students. And we see that mostly with um, youth who are experiencing homelessness separated from their parents or guardians. They're known as unaccompanied homeless youth under the law. And there are over 100,000 unaccompanied homeless youth who are identified by schools. Um, but if you look at research, it, research indicates there's probably close to a million youth who are in high school and homeless and without their parents. So now if they want a tutor to see their education records, or maybe their lawyer needs to see a record because of some kind of uh, you know, legal matter that the lawyer is trying to help them with, who signs a consent form for them if they're under 18 and their parents aren't around? So the Department of Education allows unaccompanied homeless youth to sign that consent, but it's not required that schools allow them to do that. Um, and that sometimes can really keep youth in a situation where they can't even access their own information. Um, so that's something that we'd love to see Ed do a little bit more on. Um, California has a state law that allows unaccompanied homeless youth 14 and over to access their records um, just as if they were parents. Um, but that can, be, that can keep youth uh, stuck uh, in a situation where they can't get their own information. Thank you for highlighting those super important issues, Patricia. I think that created a lot of value for me, and I think a lot of people on the call might not have known that beforehand. Um, Amelia, turning to you, um, during the pandemic, we've seen a lot of concerns about school districts monitoring students online. This is something that Patricia also alluded to earlier, especially during remote learning. From your perspective, what are the main privacy and equity concerns that come with monitoring students' online activity? So there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, 
many people know, not everyone knows that there is some level of monitoring that is required under federal law. So the Children's Internet Protection Act requires that schools that receive E-rate funding, which more than 95% of schools receive, uh, must uh, filter and monitor their networks. And we very kindly have not received an update on what that means since 2003 when monitoring was the teacher looking over your shoulder in the computer lab. Uh, so uh, there is wide divergence across the country, both in what districts are doing and what they think they're legally required to do. Some districts feel like they're able to do a fairly hands-off approach, um, especially those where uh, students um, uh, really trust the school and will come to them if there's an issue. Some do much more in-depth uh, monitoring down to potentially even key logging um, or broadly scanning things at all hours. Um, so obviously there are many privacy concerns that can come up because of this. And we expect schools to supervise kids. There is an expectation and a legal responsibility for schools to make sure that students are safe, to try and prevent bullying, sexting, uh, all of the different um, things that can occur on devices. But how can we balance all of that with the necessary privacy protections? And that's incredibly, incredibly hard to do. And it's become even more difficult over the past year and a half because now, of course, kids aren't even on school grounds. They've been working out of their home. We get a window into what's going on behind them and uh, into the messages that they might be sending their grandmother because we're all living online now. And some of these kids didn't have devices. Some of these kids didn't have uh, internet and are using a hotspot provided by the school. And so we are monitoring and often uh, penalizing students for, you know, activities that other students are doing, but they can afford a personal device to do those things, whether it's chatting with a friend or, you know, looking up an inappropriate website. And we really need to ask, you know, as monitoring, as technology evolves and monitoring can become more intense, how far do we want to go with this? And a lot of it is a question about community norms. How do you limit that disproportionate effect on marginalized communities, on students that don't have their own devices? How do you make sure that um, penalties uh, are not disproportionately harming marginalized communities? And how do you how do you fulfill the school's responsibility to supervise without breaking the trust between the student and the school and between parents and the school? Because if you're monitoring everything, it's not that you're going to catch everything. It's not universal. Uh, if you are watched, your behavior changes. And so some students that might have previously looked up help related to a mental health forum or, you know, looked up uh, LGBT community uh, contacts may have, you know, asked Google, Google, why do I feel this way in the past? If they know they're being watched and that what they type might end up in a visit to the principal's office tomorrow, they're maybe not going to seek out help. They're not going to find that community. And that's a big problem. Monitoring keeps being implemented without conversation in too many school districts across the country. Um, and parents generally have almost no idea about the scope and breadth of the monitoring that goes on. Um, the fact that sometimes it occurs on personal devices, not just school devices. And it's really, really important, um, including as we go back to school, that we find ways to be more transparent and to balance those responsibilities of supervising and taking care of kids with not chilling their ability to trust the school, to learn, and to seek out answers online.
Thanks so much, Amelia, for that overview. Um, Olga, from a parent's perspective, I'd like to hear more about kind of balancing those two interests that Amelia was talking about. So when would you want schools to be monitoring your children? And then on the flip side, under what circumstances would you consider monitoring to be an invasion of privacy? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we need to be really careful both as, as parents in, in schools. Uh, there's a fine line between monitoring and surveillance, right? And we need to be very aware of that. I think, um, you know, as a parent with kids in school, uh, whether they're on school provided devices or not, um, you expect a certain monitoring of your kids' activity while during school hours, just the same way that they would do it in the school when they're in person, right? Um, the teacher makes sure they get from point A to point B and, and they're supervising them. They're, they're making sure that they're doing what they need to do and, and off they go. Um, it gets tricky and, and lines blur when you're online because as Amelia said, if a kid is on a school provided device or even their personal devices, but under the school account um, because it's the only account they have and they start to Google certain things because they need help. Uh, the school needs to be very careful on whether that is something that you are going to call the kid in for to the principal's office, or is it something that maybe you want to approach differently, right? Um, we need to be careful and in not instilling fear in students. Um, and I think a lot of kids these days do feel that they're not just being monitored, but but being watched, and there's a difference. And um, we're, we need to be very careful on that. I think it's important for schools to monitor the kids' activity. Uh, you know, you have an eight or a nine-year-old and the teacher sends them over to YouTube to look at a video on how to solve a math problem and their songs and it's great. And then off they go into the rabbit hole and you never know what they're gonna find, right? So you want the school to monitor that activity. You wanna make sure that they're safeguards in place so they don't go into a rabbit hole that's age inappropriate for them, right? That's That as a parent, I expect the school to do. Um, but I don't want the school to be monitoring my children's activity on, on certain issues that might be of concern to them that I need to know about or the school really needs to take a step back because that is invading their privacy on their own time on what they're doing or, or what they're looking for. Um, I think when we have vulnerable communities and when you have school provided devices, some schools didn't give the option to use your personal device. You had to use a school provided device. And, and you know, younger students don't know the difference and they will Google on any device they have, right? And they're looking for things that are important to them. Um, you know, I'm sure Patricia sees this all the time when, when kids are looking for resources to help themselves. And um, that's when schools need to work with the parents. That's when they need to be aware that they're, they're monitoring, but it's not surveillance, that it's not punitive when a kid goes in and looks for a resource because they need it. Um, but also be careful how you're approaching it, right? Um, and respect that privacy. Again, giving students that agency in, in deciding what they want the school to know about them and whatnot. Thanks so much, Olga. And I, I think what I'm hearing from you also is the importance of communicating to students on how they're being monitored as well. So they, they have that same agency piece. Um, Melissa, I'd like to hear from your perspective as a school administrator at a school district, what drives schools to implement monitoring programs and what limitations do you think there should be? And I almost jumped in when Amelia was speaking because she speaks my language, but um, we have that other side that I'm glad Olga mentioned, which is we do have a federal, you know, we, we federal mandate, we have to monitor. We're an E-Race school, we have to monitor. What does that look like? That's up for interpretation. But we also have this expectation that we keep our kids safe in our doors. And we, as school districts, take that incredibly, um, incredibly heavy-hearted, right? Like we want to keep our kids safe. We have these discussions all of the time with our counselors. Um, and finding that um, surveillance, I love the way you said surveillance versus monitoring. We're not actively, we should not have active surveillance on our students, but we should have a way to monitor and alert us when we need to be concerned. Um, 
And we need to be careful about what vendors and providers we use to do that with. Um, I go back to, um, you know, I have a content filter. I have to have a content filter. That content filter has to cache every search that is happening. That's by nature what that, that software does, right? That, that service caches every single internet search that happens. So to me, if I have any type of monitoring of what's happening, then it should only be with that vendor. I shouldn't be hiring somebody else to also have intercept all of that traffic. And so if we have to content filter and we're intercepting and, and it's monitoring all of that, then um, what do we do with that data? Is it something that we're using to build relationships and communication and trust with our families? Or are we using it as punitive because you know I'm a kid and I am looking up inappropriate sites? I will tell you, I tell my principals, I wouldn't waste a minute on any of that. You know, um, if, if they if they kind of go and look, but if it becomes a habit, um, we did have a few things that get flagged that we're highly concerned of. A kid in a chat room, and, and it always gives me chills. And these are things that, man, I'm glad we can intercept. I'm glad we can keep kids safe. It, it's a double-edged sword here. But I had a kid in a chat room that the chat room was was is a chat room where adults are preying on youth and they're trying to traffic the kids man that is a site i want to know what kids on especially if they're on a school device and so we have this also legal obligation to keep our kids safe and and i'll talk on the other side that i know nobody really wants to oh or we don't always want to talk about is we also have a liability to keep our kids safe on our devices. So even if it's at their home, if they're on their school account, and we have a reason to know that they're doing something that could really harm them, we have a liability there if something happens to them, if we have access to that data, and we need to make sure that we have some safeguards in place. Do we review it? Do we have alerts? Is our approach we're hands off? We need to communicate that we need to have a policy and procedure. And, and again, very, very much what is the culture of your community? What are your community expectations within that? And, um, and have those open conversations. We, you know, if we can present or prevent a kid from committing suicide, um, I think everybody would argue that that is a wonderful thing to be able to do. But where do you cross that line to diving into other mental health issues? And, and how do you build those relationships? And those are all great questions that we have all of the time. Um, I do think that we have to be careful as districts not to go overboard on the monitoring. Um, and I know that there's services out there that monitor students' social media um, and they monitor other things about that student life. And we have to be really careful about, you know, where are our liabilities and our legal expectations? And then when are we crossing that line? And I think we definitely have to have those discussions because you can very easily go into the gray area and then very easily cross over into that line of where we're kind of invading privacy. And I know it was on one of these panels that we've had over the course of the years, but um, somebody mentioned to me or mentioned, and it really stuck with me and it still does. When we were all kids, we had so much freedom to our own thoughts and our own conversations. We didn't have technology, right? We weren't talking with our friends over technology. We we're having real conversations and we didn't have somebody that was able to see and hear into every aspect of our lives. And we do need to take some time to understand what that impact is on our kids when they feel like they're always being watched and they're always in that eye. Um, and and honor that in them, that that there is less privacy in their world than what we had when we were little. And how do we how do we preserve some of that for them? I, I guess is a big question. I don't have a great answer for you. I what my answer is have conversations um, and be open to feedback and other people's opinions and do what's right for your community and for your students. And I firmly believe if we all have the best interest of our students in mind, we can find a place, we can get to that place that, that we should be at. So I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't have the, the perfect answer there, but I, I think it's, it's really about that communication and it's hard. Thank you, Melissa. I mean, I think you just, all of you just outlined really perfectly how it's such a complex issue. There are so many stakeholders that need to be involved in this conversation. And there's a lot of imperatives that are kind of driving the need for monitoring versus how we put limitations on it. Um, I, I just wanna... add really quickly um, a couple things that 
forgot to say that everyone else reminded me of, which is I really want to point people to Melissa as one of, you know, the best people working on data governance um, for school districts, because I think one of the core things in an area like this where there are so many good reasons for monitoring and it's so easy for it to spill over into that creepy surveillance area the thing that puts privacy guardrails around that is data governance is retention policies deletion policies how you set up the software are you scanning everything and it's only collecting data if there's you know a hit or are you creating a full profile of everything a child does online that's just there um, for anyone to look it up? Um, and is the software that's being used evidence-based? Um, what is the process to add new technology? Um, so not only, as Melissa said, um, if you already have somebody doing filtering and monitoring, not you know necessarily adding another company to get access to the same information, keeping it in one place, but that also means you know as more companies are offering uh, more advanced uh, scanning, where they um, claim to detect not only um, inappropriate content but also things like self harm mental health issues or threats, being very careful and especially with threats, skeptical about whether technology can actually do that. Overwhelmingly, um, there's a lot of false flags that pop up. Shooting basketball gets, uh, you know, tagged uh, as, you know, a potential threat issue. Um, we know a lot of slang uh, used in marginalized communities gets disproportionately flagged um, from these systems. And you have a lot of law enforcement um, offices that have actually stopped doing social media monitoring or other things because you could spend that time better elsewhere versus just going through a bunch of tweets. You can develop relationships with your community. Um, I think all of that is really, really important. And then the final thing is, being very, very careful that you don't only have a detection tool, but you also have a plan for what happens after you detect something. So you're doing self-harm monitoring. I understand where you're coming from. I understand the value and how much we desperately want kids to be okay, particularly after this incredibly hard year. What's the plan? Have you hired more counselors? for the things that you're seeing. Uh, how are you going to make it not creepy for students to you know, have somebody come and say, I know what you did on the internet last night. <laughs> um, like how, how are you gonna build in the things that help students do better, feel better, um, have that trusted relationship with the school? Uh, and I think too often, you know, we look to technology as a solution uh, when, first of all, the technology isn't there yet, um, but also um, it may not be the best use of uh, school district staff time and monetary resources. Just, just to add real quick to, to Amelia, um, algorithms are not neutral, right? Uh, <laughs> they're very biased. So whenever anybody's trying to use any system that's gonna flag something, um, as you said, Amelia, shooting basketball is up there. Um, you know, my kids do fencing, right? And they'll talk about swords, <laughs> that will be out there. So, um, you know, algorithms are not neutral. So we need to be very careful with that. Olga, that's actually a fantastic segue into our next question. Um, so I'm not sure how many folks are aware of a data sharing arrangement that was in Pasco County, Florida, between a school district and a local sheriff's office, which actually brought, att brought attention to some of the risks of schools sharing data with third parties, especially law enforcement. Amelia, please provide us with some background on this. I'm going to drop a link to the article and our little analysis of it in the chat. And I'd love to hear some of the associated student privacy and equity concerns that were brought about by the situation. Absolutely. So uh, 
first of all, want to applaud the Tampa Bay Times, which did an in-depth multi-month uh, investigation of a predictive policing system in Pasco County, Florida, um, where they, you know, filed a million Sunshine Act requests and, and really did dig through this information. I think they talked to me like three times before they actually published their article uh, to like go in depth on, wait, what does FERPA mean for this? Um, so what happened was you had this predictive policing system that uh, the sheriff's office was um, using over the past several years. And part of that was a list of kids who were likely to be potential criminals. Um, and some of the data that was being fed into this system uh, at the sheriff's office was coming from the school district. That alone raises some pretty big red flags, let alone sort of taking minority report as a good idea as opposed to a warning tale. Um, and uh, we still don't know the full scope of what was happening. Um, there's some possibility that there was uh, inappropriate or contrary to the contract between the district and the sheriff's office access of student information system. There may have been uh, other school data accessed or shared um, in violation of the law. But the one thing we do know is that um, the sheriff's office said that the flags in the school early warning system of which kids were at risk or off track, which was 20,000 students, that list of names was sent over to the sheriff's office. The sheriff's office then ran that list of names by a list of at-risk kids um, that were labeled at risk by social services, and then finally filtered the list by kids who had interactions with law enforcement in the past and ended up with a list of 420 potential criminals. That's illegal <laughs> under FERPA. That is flat out, no question, illegal. Um, doesn't matter, you're just using it to filter down to a list. It is illegal. Um, so Department of Education has opened up an investigation. Um, been really happy Chairman Scott's been uh, a leader in pushing for the Department of Ed to investigate this and pushing for answers from the district. You have um, an amazing coalition led by NAACP, uh, Legal Defense Fund and Southern Poverty Law Center that's been trying to educate parents in the district. But it opened up the question for a lot of people, how many other districts is this sort of data sharing occurring in without people necessarily realizing that it is against the law or at a minimum that it might be highly inappropriate. Um, as I said, the story came out because of a multi-month investigation by a statewide paper. We haven't had very many um, similar investigative journalism uh, deep dives and we have 14,000 school districts across the country. So it's a good time for everybody to be asking questions about you know, especially as we're discussing the role of law enforcement and school mother, there should be any role. Um, what are the contracts? What are the data sharing measures? What is the privacy training? Uh, what are the decisions that are being made um, often without community input? Thanks, Amelia. Um, I think this situation that we just discussed kind of goes into the next question that I have prepared for the panelists as well. Um, so how do privacy concerns attach to broader educational and societal issues? So for example, we've talked about this throughout the panel, there's been an increased attention to students' mental health and well-being. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on how privacy plays a role in these, in these questions that are coming about, starting with Patricia. Thanks. And you're right. I think what Amelia's comments flow right into this because, um, you know, for us, from our perspective, we've all talked about how lack of privacy can be traumatic. It can lead to mental health stressors. Um, it, it is not equitable. Uh, different populations are affected more and in different ways by this. Um, and what I see is a concern about it just leading to students separating from school entirely. If you think school sending your name to the police um, or doing other things to violate your privacy that can lead to just a separation from school. 
Um, you know, I know from my work that not having a high school degree is the single highest risk factor for a young adult to experience homelessness. Um, so talk about a connection to a societal issue. Um, these privacy issues really can lead to such alienation that we have families and students just saying, you know, dropping out of school or, or homeschooling or whatever they're doing. And, and that could lead to um, them being robbed of the ability to have a degree, um, to get a living wage job, to get higher education, and, and also to get all the services that schools provide beyond uh, just academics. You know, they're getting supports, food, health services, mental health services, peer relationships, adult relationships. So um, it, it really is, sometimes it can feel like a very sort of specific tiny issue, but I think privacy is actually a tremendously important issue for education and for society as a whole. Thanks, Patricia. Olga? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it, it, there is that concern, right, is, is how are we affecting students and outcomes by, uh, you know, releasing information or sharing information with inappropriate, in inappropriate ways. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that, you know, data is, is important and, and we need that information to, to help kids, to help kids in disenfranchised communities, um, vulnerable kids, kids at risk, I mean, it, that's that's critical too. And I think it's important for us to, to dive into those concerns of where do we release information? Who do we release it to um, so that we can help kids, um, but not mark them as, you know, these this group of kids is gonna, they're gonna be criminals in 10 years, right? I mean, predictive analytics like that is very, very dangerous. and. And as Amelia said, you know, it's downright illegal to share that kind of information, but it, there is a balance, I think, in that, in, in saying, you know, we need to be careful who we're giving this information to or what kind of information are we collecting, uh, but at the same time recognizing that there is value in that information, whether it's aggregate data or, or data for individual kids in certain schools and be careful how we're sharing it, but how we're using it as well to benefit them. Thank you, Olga. Melissa? So I don't know if I'm gonna follow those two, but um, we, I think that sometimes we fail to realize how easily influenced we are as individuals and how when people collect data and profile, then, and we use data through a biased lens, um, our outcomes aren't the, the true outcomes that we need to have, I guess is the best way to say it. We can, you know, you take social media advertising, and I'm going to go to something everybody knows because this is an incredibly complex issue, but social media gathers all of this data and then they target me with advertisements that's in line with my belief systems, right? And so I'm more likely to buy them and then they can influence me and my decisions and then they can um, start then targeting other things that they show me within my belief structure so they can more, you know, the, my beliefs then become more concrete and more defined and we can be really, really skewed with data that's biased. And so as we start looking at data privacy and data governance, we have all of those important things about who really needs to have access to that. You know, we can very broadly as a school say legitimate educational interest is all of these people and probably try to figure out a way to do it um, and to try to justify that. But do we need to share that data? How does that data then start influencing and um, adding to our biases? Are we talking about that? Um, how do we make sure that we're really limiting the data that we collect, the data, because data is incredibly important, but also if you have too much data, then what are you gonna do with it? And how are we using it? How are we driving it? Is it really, getting us the outcomes that we need. And so it goes more globally. If we're starting to build profiles of our students, if we're not being careful what we sign our students up for, right? And then that data is being shared and they're being then targeted through direct marketing and through other profiling, um, how is that then influence them in the way that they're growing and developing as a student? And, and so it, it's this big picture that we have to see about how data is part of not only who we are right now and the decisions we make today, but how it influences who we become tomorrow and how are we being responsible and reflective and as non-biased, because we're not gonna be completely non-biased. We're humans, it's not possible, right? But how can we be as non-biased as possible and use that data and the correct data 
in the right way and limit all of the other data collected so we're not improperly influenced by it. Um, and I, again, don't have all of the answers, but I have a lot of questions up here that if somebody wants to get into a discussion with me about, I love this topic. Thank you, Melissa. And I have to say, all of you are really helping me with this narrative with your answers, because the next question I have is kind of related to what your answer was. So you talked about all of these imperatives that help us understand why data needs to be protective, protected. And a lot of legislators are actually you know, answering those questions directly through the way that they're drafting legislation. So for example, you talked about advertising. A lot of legislation does prohibit direct advertising to students in ed tech. Um, so what, are you, what do you think that the most important considerations policymakers should take into account when approaching student privacy regulations are? Um, we've been asking this to all of our panelists, but I know that we're at the four o'clock mark, so this is going to be a very quick response round. Um, so Olga, Melissa, Patricia, Amelia. Sure. Uh, be very careful. Um, be very careful of, of how you're going to frame uh, policy and laws. Uh, don't go too far that you're limiting student outcomes, that you're limiting information to benefit students. You know, be very careful of the consequences of, of policy making. Okay, so real quick, educators, schools, they need information. I cannot speak more to what Amelia said before. Um, we have some great folks who really know their stuff and we have some folks that really re mean well and really don't understand it. So as we add more legislation, we add more complication to an already complex framework. Um, the more we can simplify it, or at least make sure we don't have these mandates in place without the training that schools need to be able to properly implement them. And um, be very careful because we can have this fine line of going to protecting students to then, um, we've seen some out there pretty much preventing schools from using resources. So we have to make sure that we're towing that line and that schools really know how to implement it because they're not intentionally putting kids data at risk. Um, they just, uh, many don't know any better and we need to help solve that as well. I would say to policymakers, listen to students and parents. The purpose of FERPA is to protect their rights to privacy. So listen to what they need. Sometimes they need greater protection. Sometimes they need streamlined ways to be able to release their information more easily, but listen to what they need and write policy to meet those needs. And my final thing is talk to all of the amazing people who have spoken today from districts and you know many many others um there uh are so many people who have dealt with the student privacy chaos of the past <laughs> seven eight years who um uh are able to speak you know from the teacher and from the administrator and from the parent and from the student side, this is an area with a lot of nuance and a lot of difficulty. And it really is important to make sure that you're incorporating feedback um, into any piece of legislation you might be drafting or new regulations or anything, because small wording things can create big problems <laughs> or big conflicts for school districts and others. And there are more and more complicated issues like the ones we've just been discussing that, you know, are going to keep coming up, aren't necessarily predictable. And you're going to need to rely on the people on the ground to help point out where your legislation does help or harm students. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think that was a really comprehensive response. Um, Thank you, especially to all of our panelists, attendees, and co-hosts. Thank you for bearing with us for an extra four minutes over time. Um, we really, really appreciate all of your attention to this important topic, all of our panelists' work on these issues, and we will be following up with a recording. Um, have a great rest of the day, everyone, and thanks again.